Over the years, Tim and I have had the great pleasure of sailing with John Kretschmer aboard Quetzal, his Kaufman 47, from the U.S. to the Caribbean, throughout the Caribbean, and from Scotland to Ireland. He's a mentor turned dear friend, and we count time spent with both he and his wife Taji as seriously some of the best we've had out on the ocean. This is part one of my interview where we talk about his being a writer, which is how I was first introduced to John, and I take this opportunity to pick his brain about the cruising life. I hope you enjoy this conversation with John Kretschmer. I'm Gretchen, and this is Tim, and together we're getting ourselves and our boat Felicita ready to sail off into the sunset. Before we get into sailing stuff, I'm curious, how do you find time to write when you are sailing around? It's hard. <laughs> uh, it is harder than it used to be, it seems. Hmm. But I think because, interestingly enough, before the pandemic, I usually had time off the boat, the way our world worked. And since the pandemic, it's all on the boat. So you would think it would be better for writing. but. It has been, yeah, so there was more of a division of labor in the old so days. So like, this is the time to write. Right, this exactly. Is the time to so sing. Quetzal yeah. might have been moored up in the Mediterranean. I flew home for a month or whatever, and that was a good writing time. Yeah. So now, without that, it's weird. You, you would think I'd write all the time, but the boat is so absorbing. Mm -hmm. The boat just sucks your time. Like, yeah. So what happens is I get a deadline. I sort of pitch a story and I get you know say yeah great or I pitch a book proposal and then suddenly it's like got to happen Game on. <laughs> so I write frantically uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. it would be nice to say oh it's Wednesday afternoon it's writing time but no mm -mm. It doesn't seem to go that yep. way <laughs> so I've heard you talk about kind of the struggle of writing and like getting the words onto paper and you know I've listened to a lot of authors talk mm -hmm. about that and I'm curious what keeps you writing? Like, what compels you to keep writing? Um, that's actually a beautiful question because you don't really write for money and you don't really write for recognition in today's world so much. You write because you have stories to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and even if it's a boat review or whatever, you've sort of, you sort of know my philosophy that stories are really important. And I have always seen my life in story form. My, my life in my brain kind of unfolds like a book. And so I sometimes feel like an omnipotent narrator looking down at my own world. Mm -hmm. And writing keeps that philosophy and that point of view going for me. So I would, to say I love to write would be complete bullshit. <laughs> um, but I like, you know, I, I don't know who it was. Hemingway usually gets attributed with it, if it's true or not. but. He said, you know, he hated writing, but he loved having written. Mm -hmm. And there's something to that. And mm -hmm. also, for me, after all these years and all this writing, I don't really feel like I know something until I write about it. Oh, interesting. And so when I finally write about it, I feel like I I really have kind of mastered it or I've said what I had hoped to say. Complete. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, that's fascinating. But it's hard. I mean, you know, we've talked a lot. I mean, for me, I write sentence by sentence. I don't write any drafts. I've never been able to write a draft ever. That's why I was a lousy student. But but and I agonize over each sentence. I have a really good idea where the story's going and what I hope to say and you know even if it's a, a blog about our our week sailing, but I tend to just put it together word by word. Yeah. 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 And, all right, so pivoting to sailing. Okay. All right, so you have sailed with hundreds of people by this point in your sailing career and in your life. Yes. And I'm wondering, what are some of the main qualities that you think contribute to being a good shipmate? Um, well, you know the general, the number one rule, the only rule on Quetzal is you're not allowed to be an asshole. Um, and I think that being a good shipmate, usually you find the balance between wanting to get what you want out of the trip, but also realizing that it is kind of a team. And, you know, sailing, a lot of the literature sailing is this kind of the lone individual and all of this. And But even when you're sailing as a couple, when you and Tim shove off, it's super team-oriented. 
And the only way it works is when one, you realize I've got to make sure he's happy, he's got to make sure you're happy. So that quality definitely is important on our trips too. People just, most people come by it naturally. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm looking for nice people. Mm -hmm. um, people who have a real hard agenda and you know bullet points to check off what they want to do and all of that sort of thing. That's, um, that's, that's usually not a great shipmate. Mm -hmm. um, the voyages are kind of organic and I think that people who get in with the flow of it, I know that's a real mushy answer. It'd be nice to say, I'd like, I look for someone who's five foot two, you know, mm -hmm. um, we should stop and turn yeah. the radio off. Yeah, <laughs> so I think that, yeah, I mean, I think the interplay between people yeah. is, and so I don't know if people expect that when they come. I think that they typically think it's going to be more of an individual thing when in fact it's really kind of a team effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. So you've seen lots of people dream about launching their big sailing plans. Tim and I are no exception. Um, what are some of the pitfalls that you see people make that either delay or derail those dreams? Uh, some of the pitfalls are that people assume the boat has to be perfect before they leave. And the boat is never perfect. The projects are never done. If you wait until everything is done, you just find one more thing to do and this project doesn't work. And, and it oftentimes that quest for having the boat perfect is a stalling tactic because you really aren't certain that you want to launch. Um, I think that people assume that they have to have everything figured out before they leave budget by budget when in fact <laughs> just, Who are you talking about, John? Uh, <laughs> so these, ever could you be referring to? These things uh -huh. kind of just work out. Uh -huh. I mean, I just know how you are, Gretchen. I think that cruising for you is going to be an interesting experience of encounters with people and there's going to be someone's going to like need this this resort that you and Tim are anchored off managed for a month and they're going to realize like you're the person to do it. I, mean, I think that things are going to come into your world just because of your personality. They always have. Mm -hmm. Tim's always talking about he things fall in his lap. That's not really like, that's sort of an attitude mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of leaving yourself open. And I think that people sometimes think, you know, it's March in the Marquesas and April in Tahiti and it when in fact it's just the big thing, the really big thing is casting off. And once you do, everything starts to happen and unfold and it's so cool. It doesn't go the way you think it's going to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but casting off I've always written, you know, I, I used to write I make landfalls for a living, but now my job I think is really to help people, you know, take off the electronic handcuffs because mm -hmm. we're all tied to everything our gadgets our communication our everything and yeah so anyway I I think that the pitfalls are just not realizing that you have to stay open to what's gonna come your way and that's the magic too mm-hmm mm -hmm. yeah yeah so you need a plan but you that plan just has to lead you up to getting the knife out and cutting the lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of on along those lines, that concept of kind of being derailed or delayed to make the boat perfect, on the flip side, there are some sort of critical path or essential things sure. to go to sea with. So from and I'm gonna, when we bring Taji in, I'm gonna ask a little bit more about sort of the boat life essentials, but when it comes to the sailing part mm -hmm. of essentials, what what are those things in from your point of view? I think one of the advantages that you and Tim have over others who start this program is that you guys were sailors before cruisers. Mm -hmm. And so sailing is important to you. Having sailed roads, in all sorts of conditions, you guys can sail. And many people start this dream without knowing how to sail. And they, as they prepare for these essential things, you know, they launch into alternative energy projects and this and that, and the, the piles 
you know yeah. stack up of yeah. things you have to do whereas for you guys I, I think what is this goes back to the other question about what derails things is people don't always like to sail mm. and sailing the boat as much as you can before you leave unbelievably important every day even just staying on board the morning every time on water is crazy important and sailing the boat so that you kind of can get yourself out of a tough situation you know all right do I really do I want that Genoa to be more like a Yankee now that you're gonna go to the cutter rig it all comes from sailing the boat and I have watched many people prepare for a world cruise they buy a boat they get a survey it's all this to be done the boat turns into a construction zone and they don't even sail it until they shove off and then they get all flustered because they don't know how to sail their own boat mm -hmm. and they can you know so every day you spend sailing is really essential specific gear the most overlooked thing in the world for cruisers and it's so ironic because we're going to quote sail around the world and nobody seems to care about sails I mean, a survey, you'll get a 22-page survey, and there'll be literally two lines that say, this is the sale inventory, and the sales look serviceable. And it's like, are you, you know, crazy? Because the sales are everything. Just, just the other day, as we're buffeting along in those strong winds, having a brand new stay sale, pretty fresh main, you know you can take, we had to kind of... We had to beat the sails a little bit to get the hydrovane really happy in those really strong winds. We had to lay them out, and so having an old battered sail there just it changes everything. So sailing gear, rigging, running rigging, all of those things really should be first priority. To me, then second priority is living them. You know the comfort stuff and the electronics and all that. I mean, it's interesting, right? We had the GPS go out, the chart plotter go out. It's not like we didn't know where we were, but it doesn't throw you off your stride. It's, it's almost a relief. And then, you know, people will spend thousands and thousands of dollars on the gadgetry at the helm and down below, and it doesn't really deliver much. Um, it, you know, one stupid, your iPhone, your, your iPad could do everything it does. But the sails and the way the boat's set up and the leads, they deliver so much. All the satisfaction comes from that. Mm -hmm. I've also heard you talk a lot about sort of the importance of self-steering. Mm. For sure. Self-steering. <laughs> we know it. And you had some interesting comments this week because our autopilot died. We have a new one coming because it is really important. And we were fortunate to have the hydrovane do a lot of steering for us. So yeah, self-steering is the number one thing I talk about whenever you have to fit your boat out. Mm -hmm. And it always surprises people because the priority of how I arrange gear is self-steering, furling gear, sails typically. Because without reliable self-steering, this great dream people have comes to a grinding halt. It's, it's exhausting. It's exhausting and it's not much fun and so you don't carry on. With good self-steering, yeah, you know, even if, even if you're not crazy about sailing, you're tucked under the Dodger, you can kind of get through passages. But also, it just liberates you to do all the fun stuff, to come below and cook, to do celestial navigation, to trim up. To you know, fish. To yeah. fish. You guys are going to be essentially single-handing mm -hmm. when there's going to be so much sleeping going on on passage making with two people that for you, it is essential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Cool. Tim and I came to you as small boat racers mm -hmm. about five years ago, and we've sailed with you as individuals, and we've sailed with you mm -hmm. as a couple. And I'm curious how you would describe or observations you would have about our growth. Growth. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, who do you like more? <laughs> <laughs> I already know the answer yeah. to that. <laughs> No, it's actually been nice that Tim's come on his own uh -huh. recently and to get to know him better. And he is a good guy. He's a funny guy and a very good sailor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I think what I've observed with you, and you and I have been through some hairy situations together for sure, and you know how what great respect I have. But I think that you guys are more relaxed and... A little bit you know confident in doing the work of the boat I've certainly seen it with Tim um, and that's a huge growth thing it's a it's a really important thing it can't always stay on high alert mode 
yeah, you're always paying attention when you're sailing. You know, I give my spiel. But sailing has to also, when it's your life, it has to go off at a pace that you can control. It just can't be boom, boom, boom. I think you're really good at that. And I've seen Tim kind of realize, yeah, he can just be on the boat. He does things without you saying go do it. He's on top of it. And so I think for you guys, figuring out the pacing is a big, big growth. Um, it's easy to just kind of like, you know, be full on all the time. But nobody can go cruising like that. You drive yourself crazy and you get exhausted. And so being able to have fun and yuck it up and being comfortable in your own skin, no matter what the conditions are, that's really, I mean, that is cool. And those miles you've put in, sailing with me and on your own, and those ocean miles really, really translate into better cruising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you've spent years doing passage planning for John Crutchmer Sailing. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if and how passage planning has shifted as you've done more passage planning for you and Taji. Speaking of sailing couples. Speaking of sailing couples. Um, it has shifted a little bit. Probably not as much as Taji might like. She was, would love to just head for the South Pacific and make kind of a trade wind circumnavigation. And this big program that we have, we're calling it the big one, right? Where we're going to sail to the Arctic and Antarctic, hopefully, and then to the South Pacific. Um, has required a lot of a lot of thinking about how to do it in a way that is the absolute best timing, fitting the boat out so we can make it as reasonable and as comfortable as possible. And Taji's fantastic about that. And so in terms of route planning, I'm still thinking about big stuff, but um, I'm, I'm kind of excited that we're, we're timing a lot of passages in the perfect season. So with John Kretschmer sailing, a lot of times we kind of go looking for a little bit of trouble or we are on a schedule always. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be, a, it's going to be a mix of training passages and cruising, mostly cruising, but with the flexibility built in and the design of the, the route to be really at the right time of year. Mm -hmm. You know what, we talk about my mom and, and Taji and I talk about my mom's cruising a lot and my mom was and when it comes to the boat i'm sure we'll bring this up but for every day she was underway she was in port 10. and that's kind of a typical equation of world cruising but they were very patient about sailing at the right time of year and the big one is designed to be that way too so what's interesting about route planning is how it's changed because while the prevailing conditions are still pretty much the prevailing conditions Tropical storm seasons are longer, gales are more frequent, calms are more frequent, the weather is more dynamic. So I think you have to be more on top of it than ever. And also now with weather information, that's... You can be. You can be, yeah. To some degree you can be. And so that's going to be, um, I mean, that's a really big change in rail plan. <laughs> Join us next time for part two of the interview when Taji Kretschmer joins the conversation. Hey, thanks so much for watching. It means a lot to us to have you along for the ride. Check us out on Instagram at GNT Sailing. Subscribe, like the episode, all that good stuff. We'll see you next time. <laughs>